Okay, so thank you for being resistant and still be the, still be here after two weeks of very intense school. So today I will speak about uh, results of Maria Mirzahani, which has not which are not that new. That's part of her PhD. So they the the main paper on these results is her annals paper of. Uh, 08, but I'm really, on the one hand, I'm happy to tell this results because I find them absolutely beautiful. And to my mind, they make part of really beautiful mathematics and it's always a pleasure to speak about them. So I apologize if somebody already attended my lectures in the last, I don't know, three, five years, I'm speaking about this result basically in every lecture. Uh, but another reason is sort of more pragmatic reason is that I promised to arrive to random square tile surfaces. And actually the problem which we solved for, square, for random square tile surfaces is instantly applicable without any modifications to random multi curve and random multi-geodesics which were studied by Mirzahani. And that's why I need to introduce them and to present results of Mariam and then um, sort of any statement about random objects which I would make would concern also random geodesics. Uh, I think that if actually, I believe that if Mariam would be in good health and would be still here, uh, probably we would not need to prove our results because it was sort of in her plans to, to get this kind of results. Okay, so now, oh, so this is there, one of the best pictures of Mariam, which I know. And now today I will have to concentrate on interpretation of Riemann surfaces of complex curves, really at, as hyperbolic surfaces. So when we have a surface of genus uh, two and more, it admits hyperbolic metric, but if we consider surfaces of genus one or genus zero, we can also consider hyperbolic metric on these surfaces, but we're obliged to allow some cusps. If surface has genus more than two or more, it may have no cusps or may, may have several cusps. So this is, so this picture are a very schematic pictures of what is hyperbolic metric. Now, what I'm interested in is not hyperbolic metric, but geodesics in this hyperbolic metric. And more concretely, so I'm interested in uh, simple closed geodesics. And the difference is that if you take a sort of a regular, closed geodesic on the surface as soon as it's sufficiently long, it has all chances to have plenty self-intersections. So normally, if you try to construct, if you just launch a geodesic and somehow move a little bit the ends and tighten it so, so that you get a, a closed geodesic, it would have tons of self-intersections. In particular, the number of closed geodesics of length at most L grows exponentially in L, it's e power L over L or something like, yeah, it's grows, it grows exponentially. So, however, if you consider simple closed geodesics, they're very rare among closed geodesics. And that's, this is one of the reasons why it is somehow more difficult to treat them. On the other hand, they are particularly attractive because it is very convenient to cut a surface along simple closed geodesics, along geodesics which don't have self-intersections because the, the result is, well, is sort of much nicer. So that's why I recall several basic facts about simple closed hyperbolic geodesics. So first, suppose that we have initially just a curve on our surface endowed with hyperbolic metric. I will also always assume that the curve is essential. Essential meaning that it 
And from now on, I always consider simple closed curves. So I never have self intersections. And I would not insist on it anymore. It would be in this lecture, it would be always like this. So when a curve is essential, I assume that it is not contractible to a small curve encircling some disk or cusp. So for example, a curve which is drawn on the picture is essential because it separates the surface into two pieces. Each piece has uh, more than two cusps, so two and more in this particular case, three. So if the surface is endowed with hyperbolic metric and you assume that your curve is sort of a string which tries to contract and the surface is oiled and it's easy to contract. So this essential curve would contract to a simple closed geodesic. And the first remark that if the initial curve didn't have self intersections, so it was if it was simple curve, so the resulting geodesic would not have self intersection neither. Morally, because it is optimal and having self intersection, it's not an optimal way to contract the length. This is not a proof, but this is sort of a hint for a proof. Anyway, this is a fact in hyperbolic geometry. And please don't hesitate to stop me at any point and to ask questions. And for those who are in the audience, you can ask questions in Russian if you wish. And I will translate them to English and whatever. So feel free and you, you, you have to have some advantage because you made an effort to come here directly. Okay. Uh, so we, in the lectures of Gimos one can he already presented as the sort of easiest example of the moduli space of curves, the moduli space M04, where, where we have CP1, which has sort of unique complex structure and four marked points on CP1. Then we can send three out of these four points. They are numbered, so we can send first, second, and third point to zero, one, and infinity by a conformal map. And then the only freedom is the fourth point. And when we move this fourth point, we get a curve. And this curve is complex curve. This curve is M04. So one can see exactly the same example as a family of hyperbolic surfaces. And when we move this fourth point, the hyperbolic surface changes the shape. So it has four cusps because at every marked point by convention, uh, our hyperbolic metric has a cusp. And when we move this fourth point, our hyperbolic surface can become sort of more or less bottlenecked. And also we can chop our hyperbolic surface by the simple closed geodesic, which is in the middle of this bottleneck. And we can twist it. And this is another deformation. So there are two real parameters, one complex parameters. And this is another way to see M2 somehow, to another interpretation of M04. This is the family of hyperbolic metrics uh, having exactly four cusps on a sphere. Well, and all these hyperbolic metrics are described by two real parameters, which is say the length of the hyperbolic geodesic in the middle and by the twist, which is used to glue right part to the left part. Okay, so this is the way one can view moduli space and this is the way which I would use in this lecture because, because say in this context, it's more nature. Now, the next point is that I would consider not isolated simple closed curves, but I can consider, I will consider them um, in families. And First, I define a topological type of a simple closed curve. So a topological type, it is simple closed curve considered up to any diffeomorphism of the surface sending one curve, uh, preserving the, the numeration of mark points. Uh, actually, there are not so many topological types in the sense for surfaces of small genus. For example, 
if we consider really simple closed curves, and if we assume that two simple closed curves are non-separating, so they don't, if we assume that they do not separate the surface into two pieces, then any two simple closed curves like this have the same topological type. We can find a deformorphism of the surface, which would send one to another. And actually, this is a straightforward corollary of the classification theorem of surfaces, because the idea of the proof is as follows. If we chop, for example, for non-separating simple closed curves, why they all are in this have why, why all of them have the same topological type. Cut your surface by this simple closed curve. We get a surface of genus G minus one with two boundary components. All surfaces of genus G minus one with two boundary components are diffeomorphic. So we can always find diffeomorphism between a couple of surfaces like this. Now, if we recall that our surface comes from the surface of genus G, which was cut by a curve, then we have to make a slight extra effort to adjust diffeomorphism on the boundary. And then it would provide a diffeomorphism of initial surface of genus G, which sends the first curve to another. OK. A slight generalization of this simple closed curve is primitive multi-curves. We can consider a collection of pairwise disjoint non-homotopic simple closed curves, and also consider topological types of them. For any fixed pair G and N, the number of topological types of primitive multi-curves on the surface of genus G with N punctures is also finite. So here is the picture which we have already seen. These are the six possible topological types of primitive multi-curves on a surface of genus two without punctures. And it was already mentioned in the first lecture that they are in the natural one-to-one -one correspondence with uh, boundary classes of MGN. If we shrink all the curves which are drawn on the well on which are drawn on the surface to a point, we get a sort of the type of a stable curve which corresponds to this to correspond to, to, to associate associated boundary class. Okay. Uh, can I ask yeah, a sure. question? Maybe straightforward one. But uh, here in the, in the middle, we see that there are two curves. Mm -hmm. We uh, consider them you as mean, one curve. You mean this one? Yes. So th for me, this is a single multi-curve. Yes. OK, so we call it multi-curve, and it differs from the left. Yes. One. Okay. Yes. So this is, so for me, these six guys are six multi-curves. Here, this multi-curve has is single, all of them are primitive. So here, this multi-curve has one component, here also. Here, the multi-curve has two components, here also. And here, we have two multi-curves here and here, having three components. And probably, this is a very good example. Already, note that we'll come back to this, but components of multi-curves, so, you should not try to, to interpret these multi-curves as homology classes, because, for example, this component, so, or this component, or this component, homologically, this is a zero cycle. So in homology, you just would not see this thing. It is zero. Also, one cannot interpret these guys as elements of the fundamental group. There is no mark points, there is no base points, so it's not, so it's not, it's really a notion apart, which is very convenient in many situations. And another comment is probably the following one. Let us consider something 
for example, uh, just a second. Yes. So if I consider this picture, I hope that it is visible on your screens. And if I erase this curve, I will get a primitive multi curve, which is not on the picture. So it would have two connect com two components, and the multi curves having two components is this one and that one. So I claim that everything is there. So if I raise the curve which I am showing, it should be in the same topological type. It it which it the, the what what remains. I mean what remains is multi-curve having this component and this component should be of the topological type is here or is here. So equation for everybody, uh, whether you agree that it belongs to one of these two topological types, and if so, to which one? To the one on top or the one on the bottom? So I just... I erase yeah, this thing. Erase this curve and, yeah. then... and then we have a multi curve which has two components. So I erase the curve where yeah. the hand yeah. is on. So yeah. what remains is a multi curve having only yeah. two components. Mm -hmm. And the question is it should be differ sort of in the morally diffeomorphic, more formally in the same topological type as either that or that. But, but the surfaces don't have boundary component. And when we cut it, we. Uh -huh. have exactly this is the answer so the answer is it is in the same topological type as this one because if we cut so this i just i did not remove i just forgot about this thing this thing does not exist mm -hmm. now what remains is this and this if i cut the surface by this curve and by this curve i still get a connected surface with full boundary components so here, this is exactly the case. If I cut the surface by this guy and by this guy, I get a connected surface with four boundary components. While here, if I cut the surface by this guy and by this guy, I get two connected components. So it cannot be in this type. So by just by what remains is the only one type, and it should be this one. So I don't know whether it was convincing or not, but another question is to, Construct a diffeomorphism, sort of explicitly, or I do not discuss this. Okay. The next object is mapping class group, which is the group of all diffeomorphisms of closed smooth orientable surface of genus G quotient over diffeomorphisms homotopic to identity. So it is called mapping class group denoted not, not G. And when the surface has mark points, we consider slight generalization requiring that our diffeomorphisms send first mark point to first mark point, second, second, and so on. So now I arrive finally to something interesting. So here is a portrait of sort of generic multi-curve on the surface of genus two without cusps. So when you have a true multi-curve, it does not resemble at all something which we draw symbolically here or here. It rather resembles a foliation, a foliation and unless somebody tells you that all the leaves of this foliation or, or rather to be more precise, lamination are closed. It's not even easy to see it. So basically to understand to what topological type belongs a true multi-curve, like in the middle picture, you have to call an oracle, which would find appropriate element of the mapping class group, which would apply extremely sophisticated diffeomorphism to your surface and magically would unwrap your very sophisticated multi-curve to something elementary. Something elementary is up to multiplicities is one of the surfaces which we have here. But here, this is the portrait. Here you have portraits of primitive multi-curves. A true multi-curve 
might have several components which are homotopic to each other. So you can unwrap this multi-curve by a sophisticated diffeomorphism to something which would rather look like here. Here we have three components which are homotopic to each other. Here we have another two uh, components which are homotopic to, to each other and one extra component. Uh, by convention, when we have several, so this is, I did not give a formal definition of a, the most general multi-curve. Here is sort of a, well, not definition, but a picture. We allow a general multi-curve multi to have multiplicities. So usually the convention suggests instead of drawing three parallel curves, just to write that curve, the curve gamma one has multiplicity of three and that the curve gamma three has multiplicity two. And when we have a general multi-curve like this, we can associate to this multi-curve the reduced multi-curve where we just replace all multiplicities by one. The reduced multi-curve is on the right picture. So here I think that that would be the right place to say that the I'm differential topologies by education. I love homology. And the first homology is wonderful object, but mm, it is great to study closed curves, but it ignores some interesting curves. For example, if we will try to study our multi-curve from the point of view of homology, it would not see this middle curve because this is zero in homology. Now, fundamental group is also wonderful topological object, but it is mainly designed to work with self-intersecting cycles. And if you want to study simple closed multi-curves as here on the, uh, just a second, you are very welcome. Uh, I think that I have a lecture here for students. Uh, okay. Me too. <laughs> So, so if you want to study multi-curves like in the middle picture, then there this notion of of uh, measured laminations and multi-curves in, in the sense of Thurston is in some situations is the most uh, adequate. Okay, uh, but uh, yeah. is it true that this representation as a sum is unique or we can have uh, several? Uh, so, for example, to, to make a formal statement, if you have a multi-curve on a surface of genus two, mm -hmm. then if you, the way to replace it by a, an associated reduced multi-curve is unique. Mm -hmm. And the associated reduced multi-curve has topological type of one of the six surfaces on the picture. Mm -hmm. And it is also uniquely defined. Mm -hmm. So in this sense, you can define a finite number of patterns in this way. Mm -hmm. And another way to state it is yeah so it's the underlying reduced the topological type of underlying reduced multi-curve is unique up to symmetries mm -hmm. say for example i cannot say who is if if then if the components are not numbered i cannot say who is gamma one who is gamma two they're symmetric mm -hmm. but so up to this symmetry um, everything so the topological type is unique and actually, the number of topological types of reduced multi-curves is finite. Mm -hmm. And they're also in a natural bijective correspondence with uh, stable graphs of genus G with n mark points or with boundary classes of NGN bar. Mm. So, but uh, what's the difference? Uh, um, what happens if I add the second picture and the fourth? one and why it uh, 
does not well, equal to the third one. So if you sort of unify this picture and the, and no, no, or this, uh, the second and the third, or fourth, this one and that, yes. yes. If I add them, uh, uh -huh. does it equal to the third one? So there is, yeah. So I have to pay. This is really not homology. There is no structure of the group. You mm -hmm. cannot add them. You can mm -hmm. take but union. Slide, yes. yes, on the next slide. When the, we represent, you take represent. This I mean, um, I, I mean, okay. I, mean this I see, I see, I see. Now I see. So this symbol plus it. Now I see. I I never thought about this. That this symbol is extremely misleading. It should be probably I'm using this symbol just because everybody in the area use this symbol. And now I see that it's completely illegal. It would be much better to use the symbol of disjoint union. Mm -hmm. So there is no structure, there is no additive. Uh, no, there is no additive structure. It's mm -hmm. not a group. Mm -hmm. It's not a group. It's, it's not bad as a space, but it's not a group. Mm -hmm. It's not an additive group. So this symbol plus is just a traditional, very ambiguous notation. So please consider in, in sort of try to imagine that all these pluses are replaced by the symbol of uh, disjoint union. It would be much more adequate. Mm -hmm. So, uh, however, there is some structure. So the structure is the following. Actually, all these uh, multi-curves leave in the so in certain natural piecewise linear coordinates, the integral multi curves are represented by integer points of some conical polytope. Uh, like integral homology classes are represented by lattice points in vector space. So here I try to symbolically draw this polytope. It's the surface of this uh, conical. Uh, polyhedron. So it's not the interior, it doesn't have a boundary, it's it's there, the surface. So we have piecewise linear structure. Uh, their mapping class group acts on this conical polyhedron by uh, piecewise linear, piecewise linearly. And also the fact that we have these integer points and the fact that we have this piecewise linear structure allows to define a measure on this set. And the measure on this space of, uh, actually, I would not use it, but the space is called the space of measured geodesic laminations. So, or, so no, sorry, the me measured laminations. So the measure is as follows. So if we have, some area, some domain, some figure, which is drawn on the, for example, on this face, how can I measure the, what, what is the measure of this domain? I do the following thing. Since I have this piecewise linear structure, I can apply a dilatation by a factor milliard, and I will send my domain, which is here, somewhere very far to the right, and it would become very huge. Then I count how many integer points get to this uh, domain rescaled by a factor milliard. And then I divide the number of points which are drawn in color, uh, which got there by milliard power, the dimension of the phase in this case by two. And then I make milliard 10 to infinity. And this is actually the way we measure areas when we're in a elementary school. We, how do we measure areas? We just put the thing in a transparent paper on the paper on the on the how it's called the the ruled paper. It's called in, in English it's ruled paper. In in Russian it's millimetrovka. And then we count the number of, of, of points which got inside the the figure. Here we do exactly the same except that now we have this extra 
tool, we can make dilatation of the thing. So we dilatate it, then count the points there, and then count the ratio and use the coefficient, which is large and large and fast and limit. So we get natural measure, which is called Thurston measure. Good. I'm, I admire your patience. This is the last, I hope that this is the last theoretical slide. And then we'll come back to down to earth things. So I gave a hint of the space, which is called the space of measured geodesic laminations, which is denoted by MLGN. It is endowed with Thurston measure. We have action of the mapping class group on this space and sort of by construction, this measure, the Thurston measure is preserved by the action of the mapping class group. And the sort of the background important theorem in all this story is that the action of the mapping class group is ergodic with respect to the Lebesgue measure. That is any measurable subset, which is invariant under the mapping class group has measured zero, so its complement has measured zero. So in sort of simple-minded terms, it means that mapping class group sort of, in a sense, mixes our space sufficiently well. It does not let certain domains uh, live separate life. And, and this theorem is really important in Mirzahani's count of simple close geodesics. Now I can arrive to the, so this is the background theorem of this count. I can arrive to results of Mirzahani. So this is, uh, I like this picture because, well, first, I don't know, it's a nice picture of, of Mariam. The bold guy on the right is Greg McShane, who somehow implicitly made Mariam enter to this area because the whole story started with uh, when Kurt McMullen, who was uh, advisor of Mariam's PhD thesis, before she started to work on any problem, she, he suggested to Mariam to read the paper of Greg McShane, um, where he proved some, at this time, mysterious identity for length of simple closed geodesics on the one punctured torus, on torus with one cusp. And Mariam, and presented at student's seminar. So Mariam read the paper, presented at student's seminar, but a week later said that it looks like she can sort of extend it. And in three months after that, it was not just an extension, but she created a, 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 a whole beautiful theory. So, so, uh, so here, recall that now if we have several simple closed curves on the surface, which do not self-intersect and do not intersect between each other, then we tighten them, we get a simple closed geodesics, geodesic. And now suppose that we introduce on our surface a hyperbolic metric, and we want to count how many simple closed geodesic, geodesics of bounded length, of length bounded by, I don't know, 100 kilometers or 10,000 miles, we can find on the surface. We can also state the same equation for multi-curves and multi-geodesics, because if you have a multi-geodesic like this, one can associate a length to this multi-geodesic in the following way. So we transform it to a tight net, then it might have coefficients. So it's not necessarily primitive. And we claim that we just define the length of a multi-geodesic like this as linear combinations of length of geodesic components with weights, which are the weights of the initial multi-curve. And note that everything depends on hyperbolic metrics. So I can tighten, so initially I have just topological surface and topological smooth curves. If I introduce one hyperbolic metric on the surface, then these curves would tighten to multi-geodesic of one shape. If I introduce hyperbolic metric 
of different kind. And they, we know that there is a whole family of hyperbolic metrics. This is our model I space. So another hyperbolic metric with the same topological curve would take another shape and would have another length. So the length depends on hyperbolic metric, of course. So now notation. So I will fix the topological type of, say, simple closed curve, or more generally of a multi-curve, and it would be denoted by gamma, or rather by gamma in brackets. Now, L is a bound for the length, 10,000 miles. X is the hyperbolic metric. And Sx, which depends on L gamma, is the number of geodesic multi-curves of topological type gamma, which have length at most L in this sense, in hyperbolic metric X. So that's the quantity. So this is the number of geodesic multi-curves, which we want to count. And here's the theorem of Mirza Heim. For any integral rational multi-curve gamma, any hyperbolic metric X, one has the following asymptotics as the bound for the length tend to, tends to infinity. It is power of L, which is the power is 6G minus 6 plus 2N. G is the genus, N is the number of cusps. And so it is one and the same power, whatever topological type of gamma we choose. And what is even more surprising is the form of the coefficient. So here the coefficient is decomposed into several factors. One factor, the C of gamma, depends only on the topological type of gamma and does not know anything about hyperbolic metric. It's purely topological object. Another factor knows something about hyperbolic metric. It is, I can even say, what is this? This is the first measure of unit ball in hyperbolic metric X. But what is important right now, it's not important that first measure unit ball, whatever. It is important that this factor depends only on hyperbolic metric and does not know anything about topology of gamma. It's one and the same, one and the same factor for all topological types for the same hyperbolic metric. And there is a general normalization constant which depends only on G and M and does not know anything neither about metric nor about topological type, it's just a constant. Constant when you fix G and M. Now, what is so remarkable in this theorem. Well, for example, the following thing. Suppose you compute the asymptotics for the number of, well, to take it, to, to, consider, to start with the simplest example of simple closed geodesics. They can have several different topological types. They can be separating or non-separating. So you compute, for example, the asymptotics for the number separating and then for the number of non-separating. And since the asymptotics is the same power of L, we can divide one over the another and compute the frequency of how often do you see simple closed geodesics of one type, gamma one, or of another type, gamma two, on the hyperbolic surface with metric X. And if we divide one expression over this type, where we replace gamma by gamma one, or another expression of this type, where we replace gamma by gamma two, the only thing which in past the limit, the only thing which remains is C of gamma one divided by C of gamma two. Now, why this is astonishing? Because the answer does not depend on hyperbolic metric. Whatever hyperbolic metric on the surface of genus G with N cusps you choose, the frequency of separating simple closed curve compared to non-separating simple closed curves, geodesics, is one and the same. So this is really surprising because you can construct by hands 
very peculiar hyperbolic matrix. For example, you can take a hyperbolic surface having a very, very short geodesic and very, very long bottleneck. It would be quite peculiar. And since still uh, for this hyperbolic surface, it, the ratio, the frequency would be the same as for the other ones. Or you can construct a, a cyclic cover over some hyperbolic surface of small genus. And since it is a cyclic cover by construction, the length spectrum of simple closed geodesics would have enormous symmetry. And one may think that it would, since it's sort of, it's, it, this, this cover resembles a lot the surface which is in small genus, the frequency might have peculiar properties. No, it would be the same as for a generic surface. So here is, and moreover, it's not existence theorem. Mariam has computed all these frequencies, so they're computable. For example, if you consider six punctured spheres, so sphere with six cusps, they might be only two types of essential simple closed curves. A simple closed curve, it's forbidden for an essential simple closed curve to encircle a disk or just one cusp. So it has to have at least two cusps on each side. So it can, it can have either three plus three or four plus two cusps. And the ratio of frequencies was computed by Mirzahani in her paper. And the ratio of frequencies is four over three. So three plus three simple closed geodesics appear slightly more often than two plus four simple closed geodesics. And the initial computation of Mirzahani was confirmed experimentally several years ago by Mark Bell and then by implicit computer experiments of Vincent de la Croix and by other means. Yeah, this is really four thirds. You can make computer experiments. You see this for thirds on computer. And now, finally, I arrived to the bridge with my first talk. And I already showed this picture. And yesterday, this picture was just basically to construct was auxiliary picture to construct a, which en enabled me to construct the stable graph. And now I will show an extra meaning of this picture. So if we have a square tile surface, we can associate to this square tile surface a multi-curve on a surface with marked points, or if you wish, on a hyperbolic surface with cusps. We associate to all corners with the angle pi, like here or here. We associate cusps. And then we do the following thing. So here, uh, shaded in dark gray, we have a maximal cylinder field with horizontal closed, flat closed geodesics like this. When I go down at some point, I arrive to this singular points, I have to stop. When I go up, I have to stop here because if I bypass this critical level, my horizontal closed geodesic, flat geodesic becomes longer. So this is my maximal cylinder. For this maximal cylinder, I take the waist curve. I draw it here. And since the way this maximal cylinder have height of two squares, so one and two, I put weight two here. Now, this is the next maximal horizontal cylinder. I associate curve gamma three. It has height one. So the weight is one here. But this is one more cylinder. So here we have one more component of multi curve. Again, height one, weight one. And here, the last cylinder height two, curve gamma one, and weight two. So in this way, I can associate to every square tile surface a multi-curve on the surface of genus G with n marked points or n cusps. And now I can do the following thing. So by the theorem of Mirzahani, I can compute 
frequency of this multi-curve on the left, how often it appears among all possible multi-curves. I compute this frequency and memorize. Uh, and then I compute how often do I see square tile surfaces of this particular type, of this particular type, meaning with this associated multi-curve among all square tile surfaces. So I take all square tile surfaces with given topology, given genus G and given N number of mark points, uh, tiled with at most 10 to the 10 squares. And I count how often among this all square tile surfaces with this topology, I see square tile surfaces of this type. And the theorem is that the frequency of simple closed curves in terms of Mirzahani is just exactly the same as frequency of the square tile surfaces. So basically these two objects in this sense are completely equivalent. It's not blood genus asymptotics or whatever, it is just rigorous theorem. And this slide is just illustration of why the theorem of Mirzahani, which sounds at the first glance almost unprobable why it is so natural. Well, if we use this picture of symbolic picture of the space of measured laminations, and if we represent surfaces of one topological type symbolically by red points and surfaces of the other topological type by blue points, then the frequency is just the density of red points divided by density of blue points. How can we define such density? Well, we chop from our figure some finite piece like here, and then rescale this finite piece. And every time, so here we count number of red points which go to this uh, blue area divided by the number of but red divided over by the number of blue, and then rescale this blue area to make it larger and repeat this procedure and try to compute the limit. And the theorem of Mizahani claims that the limit exists. And morally, the shape of this blue region is dictated by their hyperbolic metric. If we choose another hyperbolic metric, then we'll get another region. So the points of the geodesics of length at most, say, 100 are in, in this new hyperbolic metric are represented by this yellow region. If we replace 100 by 1,000, then I have to rescale this yellow region by 10. And I can again repeat the procedure and compute the number of red points, divide by the, point, the number of blue points. Then I will do it when I rescale by a factor of 10 and so on and compute the limit and clearly since the collection of red points and blue points do not change, it's just the, what changes the, is, this, is this artificial region which we use to, to compute limits. And it is more or less clear that as soon as we use sort of reasonable regions, the density at the end of the story when we compute the limit would be the same. This is only the idea. There are some hidden difficulties and some of them are serious. So at some point, Mirzahani had to prove some serious estimates in hyperbolic geometry, which allowed to justify interchange of limit and integration with respect to non-compact space. But the idea is already, the idea is that when I draw, sorry, when I draw a picture like this without this blue region, uh, dark blue region, shaded region, you can sort of, there are plenty of ways to compute the density of red points with respect to blue points. And it will give the same result. And finally, I arrived to the subject of my lecture course. Suppose you have the multi-curve as here. So 
And let's take a random multi-codes here. By random, I mean the following. It's sort of, it's, it's almost, it's a, it's a procedure. So I consider all, I fix a hyperbolic metric on the surface. And I consider all multi-curves of length at most 10,000 miles. There is finite number of them because the asymptotics is length power 6g minus 6 plus 2. So here it would be length power 6 uh, power 6. There is finite number, finite number of multi-geodesics of finite length. And I take one of them randomly. I suppose that all of them appear with the same probability. So I have a finite collection of objects. I take one of these objects by random and I ask what properties does it have? So for example, for simple closed geodesics, which one are more frequent, separating or non-separating? If I take more complicated multi-curve, the question is, so for example, I consider associated reduced multi-curve. With what probability the reduced multi-curve slices the surface into one, two, three, et cetera, they might be up to two G minus two connected components. And what is the probability that this reduced multi-curve has just one component, two component, what one should expect from this K, whether it should be small for a random multi-curve or it should be large. It varies from one to three G minus three. And again, I repeat, you have to replace this plus by a symbol of uh, disjoint sum. So all kinds of questions like this. We know that here, yeah, and then I said that we do it for 10,000 miles. We compute all these probabilities, and then we pass to 100,000 miles, and we recompute these probabilities and the theorem of Mizahani about asymptotic frequencies implies that there are limits, that all these probabilities have well-defined limits on the length tend to infinity, and these limits do not depend on hyperbolic metric. So here is the first question. So what genus two, whether the simple closed curves, not even multi-curves, but simple closed curves of this type or of that type are more frequent? The answer is computed already in the paper of Mirzahani. And I insist another example with six punctured sphere is computed absolutely correctly. But here in this calculation, at some point she puts two not in denominator, but in uh, not in numerator, but not in denominator, but in numerator. So if you correct this misprint, you get one over 24. And if you remark some forgotten symmetry, you get 1 over 48. And for this answer, I'm already sure. Because now, because the first time when we got 1 over 48 and not 1 over 6, we were extremely nervous because somehow it didn't fit the result of Mirzakhani. And when the theorem that we have, because we, we, we computed it using frequencies of square tile surfaces. We had the theorem that the frequency should be the same, but the answer was different. So I prayed all my friends and colleagues to, to make a calculation or computer experiment or whatever, some implicit calculation which would make a comparison. By now, there is at least half a dozen of different calculations. All of them give 1 over 48. And this is not to diminish the results of Mariam. I'm amazed that she managed to compute four thirds in the other example correct on the nose because she didn't use any database, no verification, just straightforward calculation. I'm unable to do a single calculation of this type, type correctly without making a computer experiment and debugging some, using some, some, some database or comparing to some. So she can, but sometimes she, she made, well, here she made a mistake. So this is a table of probabilities. So you take a random multi-curve in the sense which I suggested on the surface of genus two without cusps. You compute 
the underlying reduced primitive multi curve. And with probabilities, which I indicate here in the screen, you get one of these six types. There are six types in total. If you sum up the six numbers, you will get one. And you can also divide, I don't know, this number by this number, and you will get this 48 as in the previous slide. Excellent. So basically, we have. You, we can get explicit answers to all our questions. But the trouble is that in genus three, there are already 41 types of multi curves. So the portrait would be with not six pictures, but with 41. In genus four, there would be 378. And in genus five, there would be 4,554 types. So Vincent de la Croix wrote a program and we do have this 4,554 numbers. We sum up them. We can compute the, the corresponding volume of the model I space in genus five. But from a point of view of engineer, it starts to lose any sense because you have a data which is already for genus five. You have a list of for four and a half thousand types. And if you want to see the frequencies, this is not really speaking. So the question is what to do in high January. And this is the subject of the, of tomorrow's lectures, lecture, which is the last. So fortunately for us in high January, Though there is enormous amount of topological types of multi curves, the frequencies of most of them are absolutely negligible. So, with probability with which tends to one relatively fast, you can confine yourself to several very limited, very special multi curves, or what, what is the same stable, stable curves. And this is the subject of tomorrow's lecture to give sort of analogous result for high genus where I would neglect most of topological types and would speak only about those who survive. So, and this is just a panic about you. Yeah. So I'm over and I apologize. I was so excited that I did not notice that there were questions in chat. Uh, Okay, yes, 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 yes. So there is some structure, yeah. Um, but yeah, for Anton, my- Anton, can you tell the question? Oh, sorry. Uh, the plus in the notation for multi-curve gamma one plus gamma two plus gamma three comes from the fact that these are measured laminations and in particular they are geodesic currents and so they can be added even, uh, even when they are intersecting multi curves. I, yes, this is true. Still, I don't want to, to, to I pre prefer not to consider, not to discuss and not to mention the structure of this additive structure and just consider this as a piecewise linear space in, in this context. I don't want to speak about currents. I will definitely send the slides. I will, so uh, with slides, I will send the slides to, uh, to the organizers. And I think that they would put them on the web page on the conference. So I prefer to do it say tomorrow or this weekend because um, yesterday, for example, Peter noticed that I had several misprints and slides. So I'm correcting them when I come back home. And I prefer to send the slides which are already corrected. By the way, if you notice some misprints or some mistakes, please send me an email. The email I can send to everybody. Type message here. So, and also if the slides would not appear on the internet, send me an email and I will send them personally. And yes, I will have to. Send it to everyone. Mm -hmm. 
and I will I have to change here to yes. This is my pop. And there is one, one more question. The simple closed geodesics growth rate for G, for G equal to one to G equal to M equal to one was an origin originally due to McShane Riven. Also, Greg sometimes denies that this is due to him because he used the gears analysis to derive this. Absolutely. And yes, I didn't mention some names. For example, there, uh, the lower and upper bound with uh, length power 6g minus 6 plus 2n with two different constants. So as far as I remember, the, the fact that the growth is bounded with the same power, but with a priori two different constant, constants was obtained much earlier. Well, not much earlier, but somehow several years earlier by, uh, by partly, but so part was obtained by Igor Riven, and also there were results of, I, as far as I remember, of Carolyn series, and something was also proved by Mary Rees, and I, I had to prepare the historical part. I'm starting to forget it, but absolutely, Mariam was, Mariam, Mariam's results did not grow up from, from nowhere. So they were already, some, some stuff was known, but still this, most general theorem for arbitrary G, arbitrary M with constant, which has this beautiful structure, which is split it into topological part, geometric part, and some global normalization thing. This, I find this result absolutely amazing, especially for, for PhDs. Are there any further questions? Um, sorry, uh, can you go back and uh, just explain the um, the reasoning for um, to to see the ratio from um, from like taking different yeah from taking this blue region taking this yellow region. Oh, I see. And, and mm -hmm. yeah, can you so explain. Okay, the naive one. This is the idea. This is only the so. This is only the idea, and there are several things which I am intentionally hiding under the carpet. So uh, the idea is that suppose, so um, let's forget about this picture. Let's consider the model case, which is actually meaningful because it corresponds to M11. And the model case is as follows. Consider the integer lattice in the plane R2 and consider primitive points of this integer lattice. Primitive points meaning that you have x coordinate, y coordinate, both are integer, and I consider only those points where the greatest common divisor of x and y is one. But these points are primitive. I, if, yeah. So, this is not a sublattice in the sense of a billion group, by no means. However, note that this space is SL2Z invariant. This is important because this set has a well-defined density among all integer points. If you take an integer points to integer point in a play by random, then the probability that its x and y coordinate are uh, so have no common divisors is one over zeta of two, it's six over pi squared. And more formally, it means the following choose any reasonable shape. You can choose a disk centered in the origin or, or an ellipsoid and uh, an ellipse. And then if you would start to dilatate this shape and compute the ratio of how many primitive points got into the dilatated shape 
divide and divide by how many integer points got into dilatated shape. Then when sort of the radius, the size of your shape tends to infinity, then the limit tends to six over pi squared. This is a not very complicated theorem. And this is, I didn't give the definition of the density of a subset of here into gelatis, but it is sort of seen from, from the construction and from this theorem. Uh, note that this subset of primitive points is actually quite peculiar and it might have huge holes. If you go exponentially far from the origin, you can find the places where for a disk of radius 10 or 100 or whatever, there is not a single integer point and uh, primitive point inside. But to find such a huge hole, you have to go very, very far. So, and in the limit, since it's very, very far and radius is enormous, you would not see these holes. So that this density is still well-defined. So when I say that the density is well-defined, I mean that you can choose a disk and then dilatate it by ellipse or whatever, and the limit would not depend. Here, I claim that this is true also, that this density is sort of intrinsic, intrinsically defined that would, do not de depend on the way we compute, compute the limit. So do not depend the, in the way which we, you, in, on the figure, oh, so, sorry, on the figure which we use to compute the limit. We can choose this figure and then dilatate it by factor 10, 100,000 and compute the limit of ratio of number of red points over blue points. This is one thing. And you can use this shape, which is slightly different, and make it 10, 100,000 times larger and compute the ratios and pass to the limit, you would get the same answer, which is analog of this six over pi square. Now, I am using this implicitly, the ergodicity of the action of the mapping class group. This is one thing. And another thing is some uniform estimate of Mirzahani, which she uses uh, in, in interchanging the limit and the integration of the model I space at some point, which is essential and very important and which I do not have a chance to show right now. I somehow, this slide was in the presentation and then I erased it because it's sort of a bit too technical. And uh, there is the next, there is a colloquium which is starting soon. So I, I will, if you, don't, if you wish, I can put it back to slides and I will send it uh, with the slides and we can discuss it privately. I would be happy to, to explain everything which I know about this story because I really love this result of Maria. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So if there are no other questions, then uh, well, let's meet tomorrow. Yeah, and I will speak about a similar question like here on this slide and well about this kind of questions, except that instead of surface of genus two, I will consider surfaces of large genus. <laughs>